So um, <clears throat> one of the things, what we're going to be talking about this morning is something that we don't talk a lot about in the church, but it's something that is a theme throughout the Bible, and that is the active process of lament. How do we deal with grief and pain in the world that's bigger than we are? Um, and I started thinking about this back in January, where at the beginning of the year, Phil was introducing our annual theme, which is Ready to Bloom. We've been a church plant for seven years, um, we're, and we feel like it's time to move from being a plant you know, to, to fully blooming, fully embracing who we are as a church. And Phil talked a couple times about where we're rooted, where do we find the deepest part of our faith and our roots. And I'm a naturalist by trade, that's what I do, I teach people about nature. And so I can't hear something like that without then thinking about one of my all-time favorite ecosystems, and we all have a favorite ecosystem, right? Like, let's just be honest. Um, I love prairies. I love tall grass prairies. And we actually have several around here. Um, there's a beautiful one at Westmore Park where I work. I'm going to just throw that out there. But one of the things I love about prairies is that they're surprising and they're always changing. And if you go in the summer and you walk through a tall grass prairie, the plants are it's tall grass. You know, they're six, seven feet high. The right time of year, they're covered in flowers. Yellow, you know, daisies, sunflowers. Um, throughout the season, it transitions from yellow to then the blues and the purple flowers start blooming. All summer, it's covered in birds and butterflies and lazy, fat bumblebees. And it's just the most beautiful place you can imagine. In the winter, and actually, is there a, the flower picture? I have like two pictures. There's, there's not a lot of slides. I was not on my game yesterday. But there you go, beautiful tall grass prairie. You know, absolutely lovely. Okay. In the winter, it doesn't look like that. It dies out. Hey, um, we, we might get a visitor coming up here. Um, hey, buddy. The plants die out in the winter. They look like I've had people come by and be like, oh, what's that field of weeds? Um, which gives me an opportunity to then tell them a lot more about prairies than they want to know. Hey, buddy, now's not the time, my love. <clears throat> okay. Um, because one of the things about prairies is that even though it looks dead on the top, this time of year, you walk through a tall grass prairie, it's either been mowed down or just looks like a bunch of scraggly dead grass what you don't know is what's going on underground. And deep underground, can we do the roots picture? These tall grass prairies have this root system that's absolutely phenomenal. Um, for all the six foot above ground, you're going to have three times that below ground of these deep roots that go into the soil. They hold the earth together. They lock into each other with this network of fungus that communicates between the plants. It's absolutely fascinating. And one of the plants you find in the prairies is called prairie dock. And they have this taproot that goes so deep that it finds wherever the groundwater is. And there it sits rooted in the very living water of the earth. And it pulls that groundwater up to hydrate the plant throughout the summer. So on the hottest days, it can be 100 degrees and humid. And you walk out into the prairie and you find that plant and you hold that leaf between your hands and it's cold. And it's just amazing. Okay. And where our roots are as a church is like that. You know, if we're rooted in that deep water, the living water of the earth, even when things look dead on the outside, we know that there's life flowing. Um, and so we're going to, there's, there's different ways, you know, Phil talked about praying and being in community, reading the Bible. These are all ways that we have our roots in that water. But there's another practice in, that we see in the Bible that people have done from Adam through, you know, Revelation. It's this practice of active lament that roots us in our sadness back to who God is. So that's going to be what we're talking about this morning for the most part. Um, before I launch into that, let's pray and make sure that the words I'm saying aren't coming from me, but coming from God. Um, Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for the power of prayer and of health. Thank you for everyone that's here watching live. Thank you for everyone that's here watching online. 
Thank you for this community you've given us of people who love each other and who love you. Um, thank you for being one of us and for loving us and providing ways for us to process and live our lives that are healthy and honoring of you. Lord, we ask that the word said this morning come straight from your spirit and that you would give us peace and wisdom as we leave today. Amen. Okay, so what is limit? I said it a couple times. And an interesting thing that I hadn't really thought of when I started planning this sermon was that this coming Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. If you grew up in the Catholic or Episcopal Church or um, some of the more you know, churches rooted in that church tradition, Ash Wednesday starts the season of Lent, and it's a day where people come and they actively repent of the sin in their life and start a 40-day process of reflecting on that sin leading up to Easter when we celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus. Um, and repentance is a good thing. It's very important. We should all take time to look in our own lives, recognize the things we've done wrong, the places we fall short, because we all do, and give that to God and ask for healing and hope. Um, and so that's this coming Wednesday, and that's actually a really important time in church history. But lament is a little different. A lament isn't necessarily looking inward at your own life, although that could be a part of it. But lament is taking those griefs of the world that are too big for you and processing that through prayer and through emotion, through um, empathy, and giving that back to God and saying, this is too big. We can't actually handle this. Okay, so lament is how we deal with 20,000 people in an earthquake in, in Turkey. How do you process that? We can't, right? How do you even get that number through your head and deal with that? Lament is how we process an ongoing war in the Ukraine and the thousands of lives that have been lost and ruined. Lament is how you deal with a miscarriage. Lament is how you deal with the deaths of people too young. Okay. Mm. I've been like really into this this week. It might be a bit of a downer. I apologize. Okay. Um, so when I say lament is a spiritual practice, I mean that it's something that people do purposefully. It does, it's not just being sad. Okay? We can be sad about things and not be either repenting or lamenting. Um, as I was writing this, I had the John Denver song, I'm Sorry, stuck in my head, which you know if I'm up here, I'm going to mention John Denver. Love John Denver, okay? And in this song, John Denver is in the process of breaking up with his first wife, Annie, and he's saying, you know, I'm sorry for all this stuff. And throughout this, the song, it goes from things like, I'm sorry I lied, I'm sorry I'm not there, to like, I'm sorry that the world is messed up, sorry about China, sorry about... And it just becomes very trite. And at the end, he's like, but more than anything else, I'm, I'm sorry for myself. And that's not a song about repentance. It's not a song about lament. He's just being whiny. Okay, that's just a whiny song. Okay. And we do that. We can be sad about things. We can be sorry for things without it being something that really affects how we interact with grief or deal with the world. Okay. But lament is not just feeling sad. It's taking this grief that's too big, that's too intense, and it's letting yourself feel that, letting yourself mourn for something allow yourself to live in that place of grief for a while and then go to God and say, you have to, this is big. This is too big for me. I'm giving this back to you, God. This grief of the world, we need you to, you have to take this from us. We're begging you. And it's something that is hard to get in the practice of doing because in general, we don't want to feel sad. It's not fun to sit there and be like, well, let's think about turkey today, you know? But corporately, as humans, we're all a part of the same world. We have brothers and sisters all over the world that are feeling this grief. And Jesus says when we mourn with those who mourn, when we rejoice with those who rejoice, that God is there with them. So by the act of truly mourning with somebody, we're pulling God into it and allowing God there in our hearts, but also putting God in that situation. 
which isn't to say he's not already there. It's not all, you know, if you don't lament Turkey, it doesn't mean God's not in Turkey. But it's just a way that you are a part of that healing process for the world. Okay. Um, and we actually see, see this done throughout the Bible. Um, there's actually a whole book of the Bible called Lamentations. It's all about lament. Um, it's this tiny little book. It's only five chapters. And it's squished in between Jeremiah and Ezekiel and the Old Testament. And it kind of follows this process of grief. Um, so the first chapter, Israel has once again been taken over by their enemies. They've been spread, spread apart. Jerusalem has been sacked. That's one of the many diasporas that we see throughout the Old Testament. And the people are calling out to God. And the first chapter is all about this horrible thing. We're grieving. We're upset. We hurt. This beautiful city is in ruins. Your people are scattered. They're describing the hurt to God. God knows the hurt. He knew what happened. But they're taking the time to talk through it. And this is why we're in pain right now. Okay. The next chapter is interesting because the next chapter is a why God? Why did you do this? We're upset. We're hurting. Why have you done this to your people? And we all go through that. No matter what's happened, whether it's a natural disaster, whether it's a human disaster, we all have that moment of, why? Why? This didn't need to be in the world. There's already enough pain. Okay. In chapters 3 and 4 in Lamentations, they talk about, oh, actually, we broke all of these vows to you and sinned against you and did all the stuff that you told us not to do. Maybe that's why this has been allowed to happen. And then chapter 5 is giving praise to God. You are in charge. You are the good father. We trust in you. We, we know you will bring redemption. Okay. And I think that cycle of grief is something we all go through, starting with, this hurts. Why does this hurt? Why, God, why did you let this hurt? And some things there's not a place to come back and be like, oh, well, there's these human causes for it. Like something like an earthquake or tsunami, a, a global pandemic. There's nothing, you, there's no finger you can point. Okay, those, those griefs are ones that you just have to give to God and say, we know you're good. We know you can take this pain and bring that living life out of it. Sometimes there are things where we can look back and say, okay, there's a, there's a path to this that caused this pain. And let's look at that and let's learn from it and let's make sure that we don't live in that world moving forwards. Things like systematic racism, things like injustice towards the poor, the widow, the orphan, the immigrant, the lost among us, those people that Jesus called out and told us to care about, okay? Their lives are lives of grief. People have pain in their lives that sometimes are caused by human institution and human action. That in this process of lament, we can take and say, okay, there's a reason here, and let's learn from this, and let's give that back to God and ask for forgiveness and for healing moving forward for the next generation. Yeah. Um, Lamentations isn't the only place in the Bible we see lament. It's just the place named after lament. Um, we see this, um, David, through, pretty much if you read through the Psalms, you see David waffling between grieving and reaching out and then praising God and then throwing pain back and then praising God. It's like David trying to figure out how, how do I live in a world and have a relationship with God, a world that has pain and hurt. How do we do that? So you see lament all the way through the Psalms. Um, you see lament in the New Testament. You see when Lazarus dies and Jesus shows up. And Mary and Martha were like, where were you? You were too late. And Jesus cries. He weeps for his friend that died too soon. Okay, Jesus lamented that. Um, he spent time in the desert praying to God for humanity and for the world, lamenting the pain of humanity. Okay, so, so what do we do? How do we, how do we do this? How do we take this as a spiritual practice and make it a part of our own lives? Um, and there are a couple times in my life where this has been something very vital to understanding where I fit in the world as a human 
and we all have our own place as people living in the world, and how do I move forward as somebody who can truly stand up and say, my God is good. Okay. Um, the first time I truly took on this idea of lament was back in um, 2006, and I was on a trip to China with this forestry research trip that was very odd, but I was grateful to be there. Um, and one of the things we did at the end of the trip is we took this cruise down the Yangtze River. It was like a three-night, four-day cruise. It was awesome. I love sleeping on boats. Um, but the end of the Yangtze River was the Yangtze River Dam, which was still under construction. And at the time, it was the largest dam ever built in the world. And it was flooding, actively flooding, this series of gorges in southern China. And as we would go along in the boats, they would take us on little side trips. And one of the side trips, we went to see the sunken forest. And it was this kind of offshoot in this gorge, and it had recently been flooded, and the water was crystal clear. There was a spring close by that had like cleared out the sediment, and you could look down under the water and see a completely drowned forest. And in the hillside, you could see places where there were little caves dug out. And those were family tombs they had dug into the hillside that were now totally flooded. There were whole villages underwater that we were seeing. And this whole thing was proposed to us as this like marvel of modern engineering. This dam is going to provide electricity for Shanghai and for the surrounding area. It's the biggest dam in the world. It's this amazing marvel of engineering. And all I could think about was that drowned forest and how for, for, human, for the need for cheap energy, for human greed, we've now destroyed this entire ecosystem, including these villages, people's families, people's historic homes, people's ancestral tombs. And this boat had a free bar, and most of the college students I was with spent most of their time enjoying that. And I remember just being on the top deck totally by myself, um, just lamenting, just grieving this. Now, I didn't build that dam, you know? I, nobody in China asked me about it, weirdly enough. Um, I had nothing to do with it, but somebody needed to grieve it. Somebody needed to take that pain and feel it and give it to God and say, this wasn't your plan. And in doing that, I, I spent a long time up there on that deck. I got very sunburned. Um, but I felt afterwards that it, physically it didn't change anything. The dam was still built. The forest was still flooded. The tombs were still washed away. But God's presence was pulled into that moment. And that can't be denied, the power of that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Recently, um, spurred on by a lot of things, but we, we know the world is, there's a lot going on these days. I spent some time um, looking at my own life, um, in the, especially looking at my family history, looking at the things that not just my generation, but past generations have been involved in. And my family on both sides goes way back in American history. Um, my mom's side can track itself to early, you know, Plymouth Rock type settlement. My dad's family came over in Jamestown. There's a ton of John Pages buried all over Virginia. That's my dad's name. You know, they were early, early Americans. Okay. And that's kind of cool, that history. But coming to the realization that with that means that my family was either explicitly or implicitly involved in the enslavement of black Americans, in the destruction of Native American communities, in the illegal grabbing of land that didn't belong to them. And that's a part of my history. It doesn't mean I did it, but it means that that's a part of who I am as a person, is recognizing that, taking that and saying, God, this was wrong. And whether or not people thought it was wrong at the time, and they should have, because we're humans, but whether or not they recognized it or allowed themselves to recognize it, that was wrong. 
And we need to grieve today the fact that this happened through history. Because if we don't, if we don't allow ourselves to actually feel the grief of 4,000 years of slavery, then how do we have empathy today? Okay? If we don't allow ourselves to say, this was a wrong thing that happened, and my family was a part of it, my bloodline was there, and I'm giving this to God because I can't, I can't go back in time and change it. I don't have a TARDIS. I can't like fix the past. Um, although even in Doctor Who, he doesn't go back and fix the past. So, you know, it kind of breaks down a bit. Um, I can't fix it. I can't change it. But I can lament it. I can mourn it. And I can give it to God and say, bring healing into this situation in my own life and in the lives of those around me. Bring healing into those of us who are just now realizing our own implicit biases that we all have, and how do we see that and deal with it and move forwards? How do we as a society address institutional racism and acknowledge that this exists? This is a thing. This isn't just made up. This is a thing that exists that is real, that is based off of hundreds of years of oppression, and we can do something about it. We can change that, but it's still bigger than any one of us individually. And that's where that lament process of grieving it, truly grieving it, and then giving it to God and saying, I'm taking this grief, I'm passing it to you. You are bigger than all of us. Heal this and work in it. And it's just one, you know, I'm just one small person. You know, my, my personal lament isn't necessarily going to change the world. But if as a church, if corporately we come together and we acknowledge the pain of those around us, and we feel corporately that empathy towards the pain of others, and then give that to God and say, God, we're begging you to heal this. God can work in ways that are be, sorry, my earrings are super clacky. Let me take that off. It's like, what is that noise? God can work in ways that are beyond all of us to heal the pain of generations. Okay. Um, there's a South African theologian called um, Denise Ackerman. Uh, if you haven't heard of her or read any of her stuff, she's amazing. She wrote this book called After the Locusts. I actually bought it to bring to show you guys, and then I lost it. So it's someplace in my house. Um, but in After the Locusts, she talks about how South Africa heal, can heal and become a community post-apartheid. And her whole book is about lament and about how the, both the white African community and the back, black African community need to come together, truly feel empathy for the pain of apartheid, and seek, seek repentance, and then take that pain and give it to God. And if that can't happen, then there won't be unity moving forwards. Um, which I think was very prophetic, because we continue to see places where people aren't willing to acknowledge the pain of the past, and we see continuing issues of divide and hurt and pain and racism. Um, also from South Africa, I love Trevor Noah. And he has, says in one of his stand-up specials, he talks about being in South Africa and asking his mom, how do we deal with the racism? How do we deal with it when people say mean things to us? And she says to him, and I'm going to get the quote wrong because I'm not as funny as Trevor Noah, but she says, you take that racism, you take that pain, you shake it up with the love of Jesus, and you throw it back. And it's funny when he said it, he is, you should watch, it's called Son of Patricia is the stand-up. You should watch it. It's awesome. Um, but that's basically what that practice of lament is. We take that pain within us, we feel it, we shake it up with the love of Jesus, and we throw it back at the world we say, God, we're giving this back to you now to take. Okay. Um, finally, lament isn't just, it's not just feeling sad and praying. Um, there's some things that should come out of lament. If we're truly having that moment of feeling empathy and pain with the world around us, there should be some things that come out. Okay. The first thing should be a feeling of peace. Okay, that's a very personal, internal thing you should get out of this but to know that you've given your grief to the one being in the universe that can handle it and hold it. And that, could, that feeling of peace of, I don't, have to, I don't have to hold on to this. I don't have to lock this inside of myself. 
You can take it, you can give it to God. Um, the second thing that should come out is action, right? If you're taking the time to truly feel and empathize with the pain of the world, then there's probably something you can do. Whether it's, you know, I can't fly to Turkey and operate an excavator and help clear the rubble, but I can donate to the Red Cross or Red Crescent that are there on the ground. I can find the people, who, the mission organizations who are working with the relief organization and send them, you know, send them care packages or send them, you know, again, donate. I know it seems like a small thing, but you can find the people who are actively working on the problem and support them. Um, and actually, the, the third thing is support. Find the body that is doing what you can't. And this is the thing I love about the body of Christ, right? Like, we're all over the world. There's Christians all over the world. A lot of them look different than I do. They sound different. They may worship differently. They may speak different languages, but they all love Jesus. And the Bible says that everybody is a part of this body, and we all have our own role. You know, I may be the scabby left elbow, but somebody out there is the spleen, and they're working really hard, right? So find those places where the body of Christ is moving. You know, I have a very good friend who for years has worked on immigration reform, and he, he knows he's, he's an expert. He knows things. He can talk to people. He can go to the border. He can speak at Congress, and he can make changes that I can't make. You know, if I just stand up and try to change immigration reform, like, that, that's not me. That's not my place in the body. But I can find the people who are in the body working on those deep hurts and support them. Come alongside and say, you know, this is, this is my role that I'm doing, but how can I help you in your role? How can I support you? How can I make sure that the work God has for the active healing of the world is still moving forwards? Okay. Um, so there's, you know, there's a, bun there's a lot of things that come out of lament. There's things that, there's the intangibles. God works in the world in ways we can't see. God heals pain when we call out to him in ways we can't understand. Then there's the tangibles. We feel at peace. We feel comfort knowing that the God of the universe is taking this pain and running with it. But then we can actually do something as well. You know, if you're feeling grief and pain about something, if something is on your heart that you're lamenting, there's probably some way you can support the people who can be on the ground working in that. And it's important to always make sure that faith is tied with actions, right? Actions aren't going to save us. Actions works, good works alone. That's very clear in the Bible. We can't just do good and be done as Christians. We have to tie that with faith. But faith without works is dead. Okay, that's also in there. Um, we, we still have to do something. You know, we can still have that moment of action, even if it's something that's bigger than we are. Okay. And finally, lament is often corporate. Um, and that's actually where I was going to talk about Denise Ackerman. I had my notes all wrong. Um, but lament isn't necessarily something you do on your own. Okay, lament can be something and actually is more powerful when it's done corporately, together. When people join together and say, okay, we're going to have a time of lament and prayer for the Ukraine. And voices calling out together are very powerful. You know, Jesus says, when two or more are gathered, here I am. When we get together and we say corporately, as a body of Christ, this hurts. This is too big for us. This is pain we can't handle. God, we corporately are giving this to you. God is there, and God moves. Um, and that's really powerful to think about. Um, some of the biggest changes in the world have happened when people have come together as one voice and said, this is pain, this is hurt, and we're moving together forward with God. Okay. So... So I think it's important to remember we don't have to grieve alone. We don't have to face the things in the world that are too big for us, that are too painful by ourselves. That there is a God who's bigger than all of it, and a God who knows us. 
right? Like Jesus came as a human. Jesus lived as a human on earth and felt grief and pain and understood that this was bigger, that even Jesus had to call out to God and lament, okay? And knowing us, put into, into process, put into place this process of saying, there is a way to call to God. Humans can't handle this, okay? We can't handle, we, we can't deal with all of the pain that exists, but God can. God can take this, and God can breathe life. So if you think about the most dead moments of your life, the places of the deepest grief, think about that taproot on the prairie dock plant that's going so deep in the hottest days of summer, it's cool and refreshing with the very lifeblood of the earth. Okay, think about those places in your life where your roots are, are deep in the love of God and life can be found even when things look dead. Okay. So as we close, um, I'm not going to keep you too long. As we close, I want you to think about the things, the things you grieve. And there might be things that you can't even verbalize that are deep griefs in your life. Maybe history, maybe family, maybe, maybe bigger things. Maybe, maybe you're still trying to get your head around the fact that so many people died in the COVID pandemic. Like, we see the numbers, and how, like, how do we even deal with that as a society? How do we deal with broken families? How do we deal with histories of abuse? How do we deal with infidelity? How do we deal with you know, the loss. Think about those things in your heart that are too big for you, that when you try to grieve them, you can't. When you try to process it, you can't because it's too painful. And give it back to God. Say, God, I need you to take this. This is your grief. I'm giving this to you. Take this pain, process it, and we ask that you bring life into it, that your living, refreshing, holy water be present in this situation. Um, and then, you know, l- let yourself feel empathy. Let yourself feel with other people. Understand what they've been, gone through. Allow yourself to feel their pain. And then give that pain back to God. Because he alone is big enough to handle it. Mm-hmm.